blimey, it's very oh, fragile floor. And here is this extraordinary old 18th century instrument. This is amazing. This wouldn't have been played, I wouldn't have thought, for 50 to 100 years. Mm. All right. And I dread to think what, uh, what lives here most of the time. And here, oh, goodness, look. Yeah, it's amazing. Look down here. Here's a mangling handle, which you turn, that makes the bellows fill with air and go up and down. Of course, it's not completely doing that at the moment. But at least the, the mangle... Whoop! In the 17th and 18th centuries, organ builders reflected the bold and lavish splendour of Baroque art. The organs they made were an inspiration to the greatest composers of the age. Travelling across Europe, I discovered that many of these distinctive Baroque organs still survive, especially in Spain, where they have lain undisturbed for two and a half centuries. It is sad to see something so beautiful and so old in a state like this. But some of the many thousands of organs that were built at the same time as this in Spain have been restored, and through them we can get some idea of what this instrument sounded like 250 years ago when it first played. In this part of Spain, sometimes known as the Campos Perdidos, the Lost Fields, you can drive for miles and miles, and all you can see on the horizon, one after another, are huge churches. Now, the only thing left, really, that shows the immense wealth that this area had in the 18th century, from two things, from wool and from pilgrims. And when you go inside these churches, it's even more obvious quite how wealthy this area once was. Extravagant and gaudy organs proliferated in every town and pueblo of imperial Spain. I visited one such town with Kimberly Marshall, internationally acclaimed recitalist and champion of these unique Spanish organs. So you can see the beautiful casework here, the gilded carvings. It's beautiful. It couldn't, couldn't be from any other country in the world, could it? No, distinctly mm. Spanish. Now, tell us, you know, what's particularly special about a Spanish organ that you wouldn't find on an organ from anywhere else? What are these things sticking out here, for example? <laughs> Uh, these are the shamad reeds, um, the clarine, and then moving on across, these very large ones at the top are the trompeta magna. Well, that's, that's really going to strike awe and fear into your enemies, isn't it, that Definitely. sound? Definitely. Mm. To the extent that in the 17th century, I believe, there were specific statutes regarding when the organist could use these reeds really? in the service and made on which days who? made by the clergy. Oh. Mm -hmm. These raunchy sounding organs have a robust and fruity repertoire all of their own. Battle music's a big feature of these organs, isn't it? Yes, I think that's my favourite genre in the Spanish style because it's actually telling the story of a battle. So you have scale passages uh, very quickly up and down the keyboard depicting the, the cowards fleeing. And then the fiery reed stops, which give the impression of trumpet fanfares between the ranks. These are the trompeta real, aren't they? The royal trumpets. Yes, and also the trompeta magna that, mm. that we heard earlier. Yeah. Big ones. Very big indeed, and meant to inspire awe in those who hear. In the tiny village of Abarca, Kimberly and I joined forces on a piece of this battle music.
while the organs of Catholic Spain were spouting fire and thunder, on the other side of Europe, the organ was playing a very different tune. The hymn that you've just heard so beautifully sung by Christina was written by Martin Luther, and it was in this castle in East Germany, the Wartburg, that he translated the Bible into German, whilst in hiding from some rather angry Roman Catholic bishops. Luther is alleged to have complained that the devil had all the best tunes, so not to be outdone by the devil, he took all the best tunes of the day, especially the popular folk melodies, and converted them into hymns, or chorales as they were known, and he wrote lots of new ones too. Other writers followed suit, and soon the Lutheran hymn book became a sort of melodic greatest hits. For over 200 years, composers working in the Protestant church wrote solo organ music based on these Lutheran chorales. Among their number was one total genius, born coincidentally in the town of Eisenach, just below Luther's mountain hideaway. His name was Johann Sebastian Bach. It would be hard to overstate Bach's influence on the organ. His relationship to the instrument is like Shakespeare's to the English language. He didn't just enlarge its vocabulary, he gave it a distinctive, living voice. His music for the organ is far and away the finest ever written for it, and all the composers who followed him owed a huge debt to his work. The organs that Bach himself played for a living have nearly all been destroyed by time and by two world wars. But on the edge of the modern city of Leipzig, tucked away in a tiny hamlet, you can still find an instrument he knew and played that is virtually untouched. Because of this, the organ in Stormtal's Lutheran church is indescribably precious. When Cornelia Schneider, the present organist, plays, the intervening centuries seem to melt away. do know is that Bach would have appreciated Germany's marvellous modern railway system because as a young man he traipsed around from city to city in order to hear great organists playing on great organs. 
He was also a passionate admirer of the master organ builders of the day, notably Silberman and Schnittke. Bach's lifetime saw a dramatic expansion in the organ's capabilities. In the big, rich cities he occasionally visited, master builders like Schnittke and Silberman were constructing thrillingly ambitious instruments for the grand cathedrals and churches of northern Europe. And this is one of Arp Schnitke's masterworks at the Jakobikirche in Hamburg. To Bach, this would have been a dream machine. And here I am at Mission Control. This is the dashboard, or the console, that controls this whole organ. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why, oh, why are there so many stops? Well, one reason is naked power. There are about 4,000 pipes in this organ. You need somehow to control them all, and these stops do that. The other reason is to do with pitch. If I select an ordinary eight-foot flute, that's eight foot is like on a piano pitch, I can also use an octave higher than that. We can actually use these in different combinations as much as we like. And that's just on one manual on one sound. So you can see that once you start to multiply that by four or five times, it's going to get pretty complicated. Now, there are pipes that don't even play the octave. They play the notes in between. They play like a little chord, and these are called mixtures. Let me demonstrate. I play an ordinary note. And then I play this chap. You see, he's actually playing a chord. Now, on its own, it sounds a bit bizarre, I accept. But if you add other real sounds underneath it, then it gives a sort of harmonic to the sound. Gives it a sort of snap, crackle, and pop effect. Got some special effects on this organ as well. Thunder. And Christmas bells. called a symbol stone. So you can imagine if you were a composer and you had a thing like this in front of you, it would be incredibly thrilling with all the possibilities and combinations you could do. If you were a one-time occasional player like me, it would also be huge fun. Now, there are wonderful Baroque organs in Germany and France and Spain, in Bohemia and Slovenia and Poland. But if you were really into organs in the 18th century, there was one country above all others that you just had from its maritime trade. It had civic projects on an unheard of scale, and it had a regime friendly to artists and craftsmen who were often exiles or refugees from other parts of Europe. They came, of course, to Holland. And this place has always been a mecca for the organ tourist. It's the St. Bavo Kirk in Harlem, and it has inside it what many consider to be the finest organ in the world. Mozart came here and raved about it, so did Liszt, so did Saint-Saëns, and so has practically every other organist or composer who's ever seen or heard it. Jos van der Koy holds the prestigious post of organist here in Harlem. Jos, many famous people have been to visit this organ. Why has it become so famous? It was a famous organ right from the moment it had been completed. A mm. uh, big organ, big sound, and a great visual impact. 
a beautiful church. It makes a very good ensemble for the ear and for the eye. What do we know of Mozart's visit here? They were on one of their big tours through Europe uh, to make the money and as a treat to the young boy they took him to see this organ which at the time was a new organ, it was only 28 years old. Did it make a great impression upon him? There are some pieces all through his life which they think were written with the organ in mind but when you hear the grand structure of the big F minor fantasy uh, you can imagine that he thought back to this magnificent organ uh, which he played when he was 10 years old. The last leg of this journey takes us from 18th century Holland to 19th century France. Bach and Mozart aren't exactly the end of the story, but it was at least a century later before someone came along to galvanize the organ into brilliance once more. This time it wasn't a composer, it wasn't even a player, it was an engineer and a towering genius to boot. His name was Aristide cavaille Cole. While still a student apprentice in Paris, he invented a forerunner to the harmonium. He patented a circular saw, and he shocked the organ world of France by winning the contract to build this organ. For this, is the Abbey of Saint-Denis in northern Paris, and it's no ordinary church. A thousand years' worth of French royalty lie entombed in this basilica. Imagine a 22-year-old unknown getting the job to build the organ here. It made him famous overnight. He finished it in 1841, and he and his company went on to make 600 others. The brilliance of Cavaille-Cole's work drew, as if by magnetic force, the great French composers of the day to the organ, like César Franck, for example. Now, this is crucial, because whilst in England, composers were writing great choral music for the organ to accompany, here in France, it was becoming more and more a solo, indeed a dazzling virtuoso instrument. But however grand, romantic or symphonic the Cavaille-Col style became, he never lost sight of the fact that he was part of a long tradition of French classical organ builders. One of his most impressive instruments here at Saint-Sulpice in Paris was based on the work of an earlier builder, the Baroque master Clicquot. Cavaille-Col's great achievement was to combine his new technology with the art of the 18th century. Daniel Roth is the inheritor of an extraordinary musical tradition here at Saint-Sulpice. Monsieur Roth, there have only been 12 organists here in 400 years, and you are the 12th. How does this make you feel? Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. You know, because of all these uh, great musicians and composers who have played here, I try to do my job the best I can do, uh, but it's a terrible responsibility, this is sure. What are the distinctive sounds that Cavai Cole introduced to this organ? When he started his great instruments, he 
brought some new stops like the flute harmonic. Flute harmonic, uh, the voix celeste, of course. Voix celeste, for instance, this is also something very typical. the reeds, the reeds are very typical. When I hear this organ, it, it sends shivers down my spine, so how must it be like for you to play it every day? I am now here 10 years, but every day when I come here, I just find new combinations of sound. 